welcome Westview to our services. Today, as we continue with the questions that Jesus asked, I hope you enjoy the service with your family and friends. The time has come. I'm so excited, guys, because Winter Holiday Club starts tomorrow. Actually, it starts today with the leaders coming into campus and then from tomorrow, bring your great R's to grade seven and make sure that they come and enjoy. They bring something warm that they're wearing, but still Winter Holiday Club is upon us. Come and join us, grade R to grade seven. Hello friends. As you know, Westview has been posting online worship services on YouTube since the start of the COVID pandemic. Back then, it was a way to keep us connected as a community and offer opportunities for worship to our congregation during the lockdowns. But now things have changed. We're coming back to in-person worship, and that means that the role of our online worship needs to change too. So what should the future of our online worship be? Well, we need you to help us discern the answer to that question. We will be gathering from 9 a.m to 3 p.m. on Saturday the 1st of July to reimagine our online ministry and everyone is welcome to attend. If you do plan to join us, please RSVP to services at westview.org.za. But if you can't be with us in person on that day, then we'd be really grateful if you could take about five minutes to complete a short survey online. The result will be included in our conversations on the 1st of July. You'll find the link on screen and in the info box below this video. Thank you so much. Family and friends, allow me to greet you in that very profound, powerful and precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're so glad that you've decided to join us for worship. And so friends, as we warm our hearts towards the living God, I want to invite you to share in the call to worship together with me. Once again, the words that either appear in yellow or in bold, I'm going to invite you to respond with as we come into God's presence. So friends, let there be no gap between us and Christ, for if there is any gap, immediately we perish. For the building stands because it is cemented together. Let us then not merely keep hold of Christ, but let us be cemented to Him. Let us cling to Him by our works. He is the head, we are the body. He is the foundation, we are the building. He is the vine, we are the branches. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride. He is the shepherd, we are the sheep. He is the way, we walk in it. Again, we are the temple and He is the indweller. He is the only begotten, we are the brothers and sisters. He is the heir and we the heirs together with Him. He is the life, we the living. He is the resurrection, and we are those who rise again. He is the light, we are the enlightened. We praise God for that call to worship, and we trust and we pray that God's spirit power will ultimately move within our hearts to move us in the direction of being more wholehearted and committed to the Christ who calls us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship His holy name sing like never before slow to anger 
God, the depth of the longing in our hearts, the intensity of the thirst in our souls. And in answer, you have come to us, lived among us, taught and healed us, demonstrated what the good life looks like, and then died to reveal the value of this life you offer. You alone know, O oh God, what we need to satisfy our need to lead us to the life we instinctively seek. And in answer, you have opened the door to life for us, constantly whispered to us of your love and grace, gently nudged us in the direction of our best life. And so now, as you come to us again, as your life is proclaimed to us again, we praise you, risen and living one, for the truly good life we find in you. Amen. Friends, God calls us to follow Christ, and that includes taking up our cross, because we gain nothing when we have everything the world offers, but we've lost our souls. And that's why we need to practice generous giving, even more than the church or the needy need our gifts. When we give, we free ourselves from our addiction to the bright, shiny objects that our world tells us we can't live without. And we set our souls free to experience and share God's full, vibrant and abundant life. And so Westview's banking details are on screen now. And they'll appear again at the end of the service. Let's use them to set ourselves free and to dive deep into God's life through the spiritual practice of generous giving. Hi Westview, it's great to be worshipping with you again today. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you today through your Son Jesus Christ, who was sacrificed so that we may have eternal life. Lord, as we bring you our sacrifices of portions of what you have blessed us with, we do so with love and joy, as we know it is better to give than to receive. Thank you, Lord, that we may be a part of your kingdom in this way. May these gifts be a blessing to all those that receive them. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Today's reading is from Mark 8, verses 34 to 38, and I'm reading from the New International Version. The Way of the Cross Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? 
Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in his adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Thanks be to God for his word. Friends and family of Westview, this is just a quick reminder that we are slap banging in the middle of a sermon series entitled Questions Jesus Asked. So friends, as we have journeyed so far, we journey up to this week, where couched in the middle of the text that we have read is the question, what do you live for? But I'd like to just reverse and reverberate and take us back to not only the question of what do you live for, but in the midst of all of this, Jesus asked the question, why would people gain the whole world but lose their very lives? Jesus reminds us that it is not worth it to gain things that in the process ultimately drains life from us. So the question, what do you live for, I think could be powerfully illustrated in a story that I came across. The story is told of both a hog and a hen who lived in a barn and they had heard about a church event that was meant to be a, an occasion in which the church would come together to feed the needy and the poor. The hog and the hen then began to discuss about how they could help, how they could contribute, what difference they could make in order, in order to feed and assist the, help, the, the, the needy and the poor. The hen spoke up immediately and he said, Aha, I've got it. We'll provide both bacon and eggs for the church in order to feed the hungry. The hog thought about it for a second and then he objected. He said, there's one problem with your eggs and bacon suggestion. For you, it only requires a contribution. But from me, it will mean total commitment. Friends, this is the very nature of discipleship. This is at the core of the question that Jesus asks. Are you simply contributing to the kingdom of God? Or are you committed to the Christ who is the king of the kingdom? Friends, this is a question that can very easily also be summarized by a quote that is ultimately attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson. He says, the God that we worship write their names on our faces. We can be sure of that. He says, a person will worship something and that which dominates will determine our life and our character. He says, therefore, it benefits us to be careful of what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. Friends, at the center of this question, what do we live for, is not only the question of what direction our lives take, but also to whom our lives are committed and ultimately consecrated. Allow me to give you the context of the text that we have read in Mark's Gospel. Allow me to remind you that Mark chapter 8 comes right at the middle of Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel consisting of 16 chapters, and right in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus clarifies his call to those who want to follow him. Can I remind you that at the center of the call to follow Christ is not prosperity, it is not peace, it is not power, and it is not the call to be profound as possible. At the center of the call to follow Christ is one word, a cross. Now this may be interesting because Jesus knows that he's heading to Jerusalem. He knows that the cross of Calvary awaits him there. And so it is not just enough for Jesus to tell his disciples that he is heading to the cross, but that there is also a cross that awaits those who decide to follow him. So you can imagine for the disciples, it would be already difficult to accept that the one in whom they have placed their hope, the one whom they have proclaimed as the Messiah, the one whom Peter previously in the section leading up to this text has said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, is now heading to Jerusalem to be crucified on a criminal's cross. Not only would that be daring, not only would that ultimately shatter their worldview, but for Jesus to tell them that in the same way, there's a cross that they need to bear as well. Friends, can I remind you on this day that Jesus calls us to bear our own cross. And I wonder what that would look like. Think with me for a second. If you had to market the invitation to follow Christ, what would that marketing tool and what would that marketing sentence look like? Friends, let's be honest, when we invite people to our churches, into our community of faith, many of us pass the banner of there's a good children's ministry. 
There's inspiring music. There's effective and powerful preaching. I wonder how our churches would look differently and instead, if our marketing tool was said, come and discover what it means to suffer, to sacrifice, and ultimately to give your life in obedience to Christ. What marketing tool would we use to market the call to follow Jesus? Are we calling people to easy believism? Or are we calling people to true commitment to sacrifice their lives for the sake of God's kingdom? Friends, here's the question once again. What does it gain? What does it profit a man to gain his, the whole world, but in the process lose his very soul? So maybe as these disciples are confronted with this question, maybe at the back of their minds, just like ours, we begin to ponder and think, so this Christian life is not really all about me, but it's about the Christ who calls me. This life is not about my happiness. This life is not about my contentment. This call to follow Christ is not about success. It is ultimately about surrender and sacrifice. And so the question then is, why would we bother to follow Christ at all? If commitment to discipleship seems so difficult, but seems so conflictual within our very souls, why would we choose to follow Christ? And so in answering this question, in being faithful in unpacking and investigating the question, what do you live for? I want to remind us that Jesus says that there are four conditions for following Him. Can I just put the text into context once again? That the first condition to following Christ is not denial, it is not following Christ, it is not taking up our cross. The first condition to following Christ is decision and desire. Can I remind you once again the context of the text? Jesus has previously spoken to his disciples and asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And now in verse 34 of Mark chapter 8, Jesus diverts his attention not just to his disciples, but he speaks to the crowd that he surrendered and ultimately all around him. So I want you to hear this in the context of speaking to the multitudes. That there is in the crowd those who are curious of the crowd. There are those who are the committed core and followers of Christ, who are the eleven disciples. And then there is also the counterfeit Judas, who has a faith that seeks to benefit himself. Don't miss this. There's a curious crowd that surrounds Jesus. They are the committed core of the eleven disciples who are with Jesus. And there is even the counterfeit Judas, whose faith is all about benefiting himself. So when Jesus makes the invitation to follow him, he begins it with these words, whoever wants. Recognize that the invitation is open to all people, but it is only limited to those who have a desire to follow Jesus. Maybe here, the matter of the fact is a fact of our heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of our own hearts. Maybe Jesus exposes our own hidden motives for following Christ. Maybe some of us find ourselves in the curious crowd who are only there to see Jesus when he entertains us. To follow the Jesus who is there to make us feel happy, to provide for us, to give us what we think we need. Or maybe we are some of us like the counter for Judas. We are only in it when, it when there's something to be benefited from. We are only following Christ when there is some kind of reward without any risk. When there's some kind of blessing without any burden. So friends, maybe for some of us, if we want to be in that core committed group of disciples who follow Jesus despite their mistakes, despite their misunderstandings, but yet they follow Christ to the best of their ability and their understanding, maybe we need to ask this question. Are we simply following Jesus because we want the wonders of the work of the cross? Or are we following Jesus because we want to walk in the way of the cross? You see, it's easy to want forgiveness from Jesus without repentance. It's easy to want reward from Jesus without reformation. It's easy to want success from Jesus without sacrifice. It's easy to want success from Christ without the demand to be discipled and disciplined. Friends, where does your desire lie when it comes to following Jesus? What is your true motive behind following after Christ? So it's not the difficult parts that Jesus invites us to initially, but rather he calls us to question our motives and ultimately our reasoning for following Christ. What is your desire and what is your decision? I think it's very powerful because um, I read this book called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he said the following. He said salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Where does your decision and your desire lie? Secondly, not only is there a decision and a desire that we need to interrogate, but there is also the call to denial. 
Jesus says, whoever wants to come after him must deny themselves. Now friends, can I just clarify that there is a difference between self-denial and denial of self. Self-denial is simply depriving ourselves of momentary pleasures that we seek to participate in. For example, when it comes to Advent or when it comes to Lent, we practice self-denial. We deny ourselves that inclination to go to social media. We deny ourselves that inclination and desire to eat more chocolate. That's called self-denial. It's small decisions that ultimately fester and make a bigger impact in life. But denial of self is not just about pleasure, but it's about our personhood. Denying self is about the transformation of ourselves as human beings. Denial of self is the ability to say, I no longer belong to myself, but I am claimed and named by somebody else. Whew, guys, this is a difficult, world, a difficult word because we live in a world that gives us the confidence and the false assurance that we have the power within ourselves to determine who we need to be. Friends, the power and the invitation to deny self is the invitation to deny our ability to always be right, but also to deny our right to think that we belong to ourselves. Friends, can I remind you that when you give up your life for Christ, you no longer belong to yourself, you now belong to another. Can I remind you that when you make the decision and the desire to follow Christ, there is some aspect of our being that needs to be denied. Now I want to be clear here, the invitation to deny yourself is not the invitation to deny your personality, your hobbies, your passions, your talents, your talents. you are still yourself. The invitation to deny yourself is not to reject yourself, but rather to reform yourself and put your life in its proper context. Friends, can I remind you that Jesus provides the content for life and the context for life. Jesus comes to live within and we live within Christ. This is the new self that is being birthed and fashioned when we become disciples of Christ. So there's a desire, the desire and a decision, but out of that decision needs to be denial of self. Can I remind you of the third condition? Not only decision and desire, not only denial, but also death. And I think this is the most difficult word for some of us to accept and ultimately take on board. Can I tell you why? Because we have reduced the cross as simply an ornament of decoration. Yet when the first century Jews heard the call to take up your cross, they knew exactly what it meant. Can I just remind you that in the context in which Jesus spoke, there were already approximately 30,000 people that had been crucified to death on a cross. So when they heard the call to take up the cross, they knew one thing and they knew it immediately. That the cross meant death. Death to ambition, death to selfishness, death to have the right to determine for yourself who you are and who you are not. Friends, in order for life to take place, death needs to be the precursor. Friends, I think this is a difficult word for some of us to accept. Because many of us think that the cross is simply about benefit when the cross is also about burden. Many of us think discipleship is only about transformation, when in actual fact, discipleship is about reformation. In actual fact, Paul would and ultimately communicate it in this way in Galatians. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in this body, I live by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, death. Death to a self that is not connected to Christ. Death to a self that does not ultimately follow the leading of the Spirit. Death to a self that is ultimately heading to destruction. But friends, not only is there decision, not only is there denial, not only is there death, but ultimately there is devotion. Jesus says, whoever wants to follow me needs to deny themselves, take up their cross and come after me. That's devotion. Friends, something that I've recognized in life is that the depth of one's devotion will determine the difference that they make. Can I repeat that? The depth of our devotion determines the difference that we make. The more devoted to Christ we are, the more difference we make in our context and in our community. And can I remind you in this moment that there are ultimately two altars in life, the altar of self and the altar of Christ. The choice that is set before us is very black and white. There is no gray area when it comes to this decision. You can either be devoted to self and deny Christ, or you can be devoted to Christ and deny yourself. Uh, friends, it's, it's interesting that we live in this culture of social media. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. 
It's so easy to be a fan of someone without being a follower of that exact same person. And yet here in the call to follow Jesus, to be devoted through death, denial and decision, is the call not to be a fan of Jesus, but rather to be a follower of Christ. Whew, that's a difficult word because many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we find it easy to be a fan of Jesus. We like Jesus, but we don't embrace the dirty side of Christianity that calls for wholehearted commitment and fellowship of God. Friends, can I remind you that it is easy to be a fan of Jesus who shouts when we gather in the stadium of church on a Sunday, but it is difficult to follow Jesus when you're on your own on a Monday. It is easy to be a fan of Christ in the sanctuary when the music is powerful and the Spirit is moving amongst us. It is difficult to be a follower of Christ on a Tuesday when you're faced with opposition because of your faith. It's easy to say, shout and raise a hallelujah and an amen when something about a sermon resonates within you on a Sunday, but it's difficult to worship God and remain faithful to God on a Wednesday when everything seems to be going wrong. Can I remind you, we're not called just to be fans, we are called to be followers. And friends, as we look at these four conditions, can I also remind you that there are three cautions that Jesus makes. The condition to decide to follow to change and to ultimately embrace denial, death, and then devotion to Christ, needs to be followed up with three cautions. The first one is, if you only focus on your own life, you will lose it. This is the paradox of Christian discipleship. Ultimately, what you cling to is what you will lose. This is why Jesus says you need to lose your life, lose your soul for my sake and for the gospel's sake. Now it's interesting here that the Greek word for soul is the Greek word psyche. It's where we get psychology and our own psyche in the English language. Now a soul is something that's difficult to define and ultimately pin down. But the soul is something that's a gift from God. It is the source of life within us that leads us to the source of all life. Our souls ultimately resonate most profoundly with God because our souls are a gift from God. And friends, the question then is, what are you willing to give up for your soul? The caution is, if you only focus on what you can gain, you will ultimately lose your soul in the process. Now friends, this is an interesting and a very powerful and profound word because we live in a culture that says life is determined and ultimately based on success. Can I remind you, that success is never the metric for faithful following of Christ. Sacrifice is. What are you willing to give up in order to be more faithful for Christ? Not what are you willing to become more successful in order to be followers of Christ? And then, not only is there the, the caution that if we focus on our own life, we lose it. But secondly, if you only focus on your own well-being, you will lose your soul. Friends, the rhythm of life, the rhythm of God's kingdom is that by giving away in service to others, we ultimately discover true life. Friends, maybe for some of us, this means that we need to limit how we understand our position, our power, and our social status. That many of us clamor for social affirmation and acceptance, when in actual fact, what's happening is we're losing the very essence of our soul. Friends, we live in a culture that says live for the approval and the adulation and the jubilation of other people. When in actual fact, Jesus is saying, if you are single-minded in your commitment to me, you will ultimately maintain your soul. Now, it's interesting, Jesus doesn't just say lose your soul for the sake of it. But he says lose your life for the sake of me and my kingdom and my gospel. So ultimately, there is also a direction into which our lives need to be faulted and committed. Now... If you are not proclaiming the gospel, maybe that's already telling you something about where your commitment lies. If some people that are in your work environment, some people that are in your living in context and environment, some people who you coexist with in community are never ever exposed to the fact that you're a Christian. They never ever see you sowing the gospel into the lives of other people. Maybe that's an affirmation of where your heart really lies. Which leads us to our final caution that if you deny Christ or if you are ashamed of Christ, Christ will ultimately be ashamed of you. Friends, we need to break out of this box of consistently being silent about our faith when the call and commission is ultimately to speak out about who Jesus is. And so friends, as I bring the sermon to a close and a conclusion, I want to remind us that there are some things that we can do in order to be more formed and fashioned to be disciples who are faithful to Christ. Firstly, we need to surrender spontaneously. 
Friends, have you ever encountered the fact that when you're just going about life, God sometimes sends some people, some problems, and also sometimes some persistent provision upon your way that causes you to check your own life, that causes you to go outside of your comfort zone in order to meet the need, in order to address the issue, in order to ultimately address the problem. Friends, there are going to be moments in which we are going about life in the comfort of our own being, in which God derails our path by sending some unnecessary and sometimes some unpredictable people upon our path. Friends, this is where we are called to surrender spontaneously. This is where we call, hear the call of Christ to give up what we are busy with in order to address that which Christ is calling us to. So there is spontaneous surrender, but there is also something called strategical sacrifice. Now, friends, I want to leave you with five disciplines that we can ultimately focus on in order to improve our discipleship and deepen our devotion to Christ. The first one is giving generously. Now, I'm not sure about you, but to me, this is one of the most difficult words to accept when it comes to following Christ. That the call to be a disciple of Christ does not just challenge my devotion and my discipline, but that the call to follow Christ also challenges my pocket and my bank account. It is the recognition that all that I have does not come from myself or belong to myself, but rather all that I have comes from God and belongs to God. That what is entrusted to me is not because I'm an owner of what I have, but rather that I'm a manager of what I have. And that I'm only called to manage and steward what I have for a very short period of time. So give generously. Second, I want to say we need to be reading the text and the biblical narrative regularly. Friends, you cannot follow Christ if you do not know your Bible appropriately. Many of us are asking and begging God to speak to us. And yet our Bibles are closed for the majority of our week. It cannot be that we come to church and the church context is the only place where we are exposed to Scripture. Friends, we need to be soaked in Scripture. We need to be educated in Scripture. And ultimately, we need to have a life that is informed and ultimately shaped by Scripture. Not only that, but we also need to be inviting others to faith in Christ. I've spoken briefly about this previously, but if other people in your life never ever hear you speaking about Jesus, how can you proclaim to be a follower of Christ? And can I just remind us that we invite others to follow Christ, not by being irritable, but rather by being welcoming. Friends, many people are put off of church. Many people are thrown away or move away from Christ because of our disposition and our attitude. In the same way that Christ offers the invitation to the entire crowd, to those who are curious, to those who have a counterfeit faith, and to those who are committed, we too are called to share our faith faithfully and ultimately confidently. And then lastly, I want to say pray regularly. Friends, a saint that does not pray regularly is ultimately a saint whose heart is not open to God. Can I remind you that prayer is an activity of receptivity to God's very activity. When we pray consistently, we are more open to the leading of God's Spirit. When we pray more regularly, we have a more open heart and a loving heart to the people for whom we are praying. But also we begin to have eyes to see where God is already at work. So friends, as we surrender spontaneously, we also need to be sacrificing strategically. Those personal moments of devotion, such as giving generously, reading the biblical text, inviting others to faith in Christ, and ultimately to pray and to pray regularly. And friends, I want to end off with this quote. It says, one cannot desire freedom from the cross when one is especially chosen for the cross. Friends, there is no crossless Christianity and there is no Christless cross. The cross and Christ go hand in hand and they exist in tandem. I finish with this illustration. Uh, a woman approached a Christian minister, a pastor, a reverend, uh, and she said, Will you please tell me in a word, just in a sentence, in a phrase, what your idea of consecration and commitment to Christ really is? The minister held up a blank sheet of paper and he replied to her, he said, sign your name at the bottom of this paper and then let God fill it in as he wishes. Friends, are you contributing to Christ or are you really committed to Christ? Have you signed your name at the bottom of a blank sheet and ultimately given God the right and the permission to fill it in for you? Friends, I hope and I pray and I trust that the sermon has challenged you and convicted you to be more faithful in your following and wholehearted commitment to Christ.
Friends, may the Lord bless you. May the Spirit lead you. And ultimately, may you hear Christ calling you to decision, to denial, to death, and finally to devotion. Friends, these words I proclaim to you in the name of the triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who reign and who love and love in unity, both now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, we thank God for the word of life and challenge that God has given us through Damien today. And to make sure those words sink deep into our hearts, we take a moment to reflect on our lives, on what God has said to us, and on what we're going to do with God's word in the week ahead. And so as we enter into a time of quiet contemplation, I invite you to reflect on the following questions. What things are you pursuing in your life that are keeping you from taking up your cross and gaining life as God intends? When has your soul felt crushed and when has it felt lifted? What important life lessons did you learn only later in life, when you were ready? What lessons could you have only learned the hard way? What private spiritual practices will you work on more diligently? And now let's commit ourselves to living as true followers of Jesus as we sing together. Here I am, Jesus, my life laid open before you, and I yearn for the fire of your touch to burn through me. Here I am.
friends and family, as we near the end of the service, we remember that a sermon is not just meant to be heard, a sermon is not just meant to be listened to, but ultimately for a sermon to be effective, it needs to be reflected on and responded to. So friends, I'm just going to throw some questions in your direction. I'm going to allow you to sit with those questions. I'm going to allow you to reflect on those questions and carry those questions with you throughout the week that lies ahead. The first question I'd like to pose and proposition and place before you is the question, what things are you pursuing in your life that are keeping you from taking up your cross and gaining the life that God desires for you? What are some distractions? What are some ambitions? What are some things that you know that you're clinging to that ultimately causes the loss of life at the end of the day? And then secondly, I want you to interrogate the desire or the motive behind why you choose to follow Christ. So you've said yes to Jesus, but why have you said yes to Christ? Is it because you want benefit and you want blessing? without discovering the burden of that blessing. So friends, what is the motive behind why you choose to follow Christ? And thirdly and second, lastly, I want to ask, what would it mean for you to be devoted to Christ by choosing to deny yourself and to die to those things that do not come from God? What does it mean to follow Christ? Not to run ahead of Christ, asking Him to catch up to your agenda, but rather to allow Christ to set the agenda and the pace. And for you to follow and ultimately fall in line. And then lastly, where are some moments in the week ahead where you can be aware of God's presence and spirit, calling you to surrender spontaneously? What are some people that God has sent across your path that God is calling you to serve and assist? And then not only surrender spontaneously, but where can you sacrifice strategically in your devotional life, in your finances, in your giving, in your commitment to pray, but also in your commitment to testify and witness to the goodness and the grace of God. How are you sharing the gospel with those around you? Friends, as you reflect and as you respond to these questions, I trust and I pray that the Spirit would illuminate something of the goodness of God within you. May God keep you, may God bless you, and may God sustain you for the week ahead. And so we come to the end of our time together, friends. As we close, let's greet each other again with this ancient blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And let's go into this week with a renewed commitment to take up our crosses and follow Jesus in His way of abundant life. Thank you for joining us. Have a meaningful and life-giving week, and God bless you.